So as mentioned, I'm speaking on behalf of a person who has participated to the development of the European Product and Organization Environmental Footprint Initiative since the beginning. And I will take advantage in a few minutes to share the process. And then I will be followed by a colleague of mine who will share uh, the experience from his perspective. And then we will conclude by the next steps. Just to make sure everybody is on the same page, the reason the PEF and the OF, the Product Environmental Footprint or Organization Environmental Footprint was developed, was to start to answer based on life cycle assessment questions such as, shall I buy paper or plastic bags? Or if I want plastic bags, is it better to use petrol-based or bio-based plastic? The food being a key sector for sustainability, a lot of questions were around food, like, is it better to eat beef or pork? And if you want beef, is it better to eat beef coming from free range grazing or from cattle feed? And the most common topic when we speak about life cycle assessment, from my perspective, is coffee. And I will use coffee as an example throughout the presentation. So one question could be which coffee has the lowest impact? And if you decided to buy a coffee that is capsule based, you could say which type of capsule has the lowest environmental impact between, for example, aluminum, plastic, bioplastic, etc. To answer those questions with an idea to even communicate that to the consumer at the supermarket, the European Commission has launched the European Product Environmental Footprint or Organization Environmental Footprint at the end of 2009-2010 with a series of tests and publications and came up in 2013 with the, official, with the official publication of the PEF guide or OEF guide in the official journal of the European Union. That was a general a document describing how an environmental footprint has to be calculated. But at that time, it was just general guidelines. There were no specific methodology, especially no specific default values and rules depending on the product. And there were also no way to communicate that information. On the slide, you can see a few examples of ideas of how to communicate the environmental footprint to consumer. So in 2013, the European Commission decided to launch a test to apply the PEF guide, so what is published in that document, to different product categories as well as different organizations and see how it would be possible to calculate the footprint as well as test different ways to communicate that footprint. So, as I mentioned, everything started around 2008, 2010 with the original uh, guidelines, the original guide, if you want to be correct with the wording, for PEF and OF, followed by the drafting and brainstorming until 2013 of how we could calculate the PEF of different products and different sectors, what we call a PFCR, Product Environmental Footprint Category Rules, or OEFSR, Organization Environmental Footprint Sector Rules. And in 2013, the big test started. Originally, it was meant to last until 2016. In practice, it's actually finished last year in 2018. The way this is structured is that you basically have the European Commission which called DG for Directorate General for the Environment, as well as GRC, which is a joint research center, which is some kind of the internal LCA consultant of the European Commission, managing the big project with a group of stakeholders. I would say up to 1,000 people have participated to the development of the PEF and the OF, of which around 100 were part of a so-called technical advisory board which is basically a group of people with knowledge in life cycle assessment 
helping the European Commission to draft the detail of the guidelines, as well as a so-called steering committee, which is more a political body typically made of one person per country, as well as one person per major NGO and one person per industry group, who was, at the end, formally speaking, validating the outputs of the European Commission and the Technical Advisory Board. That was helped by lots of working groups. Typically, people must have heard the working group on the allocation among the different parts of a beef, like the meat allocation or dairy allocation, cattle allocation, as well as the end of life, how to model end of life impacts and benefits, how to allocate it, the impacts and benefits, etc. So, until 2018, the different people, different groups worked together to develop originally 27, it went down to 23, I'll mention after, product um, category group, as well as sector group, uh, um, rules for product categories, as well as rules for, for sectors. By defining the category of sector to be analyzed, defining what we call a representative product, what is the typical product, for example, for coffee, then having a screening, a screening being a quick life cycle assessment to identify the most relevant life cycle stages, processes, impacts, then draft the category or the sector rules, then having this draft being tested by so-called supporting studies by different companies, the idea is minimum three companies have to test uh, for each uh, draft so that we can see if the draft is applicable. Based on the learning of the test, we had a so-called remodeling of the representative product, meaning we remodel the screening based on the validated rules so that we obtain what we call a benchmark, an ex a benchmark for the average product of that product category. And that led to so-called final PFCR OFSR. And these PFCR OFSR got validated between 2017 and 2018. I will give you the full list at the end. Um, I will not talk about the future from now on. We'll come back on that later. But let me first give you more information on what has been developed within this phase. In summary, we have a rule, a guide, or in guidance, that explains how to calculate the environmental footprint typically of products, like a normal life cycle assessment, taking into account the full life cycle, having all the inputs and outputs, and 16 impact categories. That's the 16 impact categories that have been validated by the European Commission. I will simply mention in here quickly so that you have that in mind. Of course, carbon footprint, but also the impact categories related to resource use, all the one related to affecting human health like ozone depletion, human toxicity, radiation, respiratory inorganics, that means particles, and photochemical ozone formation, as well as impact categories affecting ecosystems like land use, eutrophication, ecotoxicity, acidification, and water scarcity, also called water footprints, to be simple. What I'm showing in blue are those affecting more water, and the one in dotted lines, be basically human toxicity, cancer, non-cancer, as well as freshwater ecotoxicity, which is missing the dotted lines, sorry. Those are more uncertain and are not included in the calculation of the so-called single value. Single value that should help calculate typically a score like A, B, C, D, E, like people are used to see for energy rating. And the idea was to reach the same type of rating for environmental footprint. However, this has not yet been done in the process. Let's say we did not manage to agree on a rule to communicate that. So what the PEF has done yet is all the rules to come up with a calculation of the impact categories 
as well as a single value. The original PEF guide produced in 2013 is not detailed enough to allow a consistent calculation. That is why during this test phase between 2013 and 2018, we have developed a so-called guidance, subtlety between guide and guidance. The guidance gives a lot of default data. I'm just giving you an example of screenshot here. You have default data for um, emission at the field. You have default values for the impact assessment. And you have, for example, default equation for the allocation at end of life. The message here is that there is a lot of default values and default equation that are given in this guidance to make sure that everybody calculating their PEF calculate them in a consistent way. Example, using the coffee. A PFCR was proposed for coffee. Different companies got involved. I'm simply showing an example here to show that this, this PFCR was not developed in the corner by the European Commission with one or two experts. They were really representative of all the major actors. For example, for coffee, if you simply take Nestle and uh, GDE, you capture about 50% of the European coffee. Then you have smaller players like Lavazza, Cibo, Ili, etc. But interestingly, we also have the suppliers, for example, the Colombians producing the coffee. And we also have the suppliers of packaging, for example, Flexible Packaging Europe producing the packaging, etc. We also had NGO like Sol Solidaridad. So the message that you had a wide range of stakeholders involved in the development of PFCR. For coffee, we managed to develop the so-called draft PFCR. The draft PFCR basically gives the rules of how to calculate the environmental footprint of a coffee-based beverage sold in any market. The scope is Europe, but it's every coffee sold in Europe, meaning if you produce the coffee outside of Europe, you are part of those rules. It gives a life cycle stage you have to consider for the coffee, including other ingredients. If you make milk uh, coffee, if you put cream in your coffee, etc., as well as the machine used to brew the coffee. The PFCR gives you default data. If you have no idea where your coffee comes from, there is default data so that every person assessing the footprint of the coffee at least uses the same assumption. If you don't have actual data, for example, distance of transport from the farm to the port. It gives default uh, unit process for the production of, for example, the fertilizer. The goal is that everybody modeling the production of the coffee, we want to make sure there is no differences due to an assumption of what kind of nitrogen fertilizer you use, for example, as well as Irrigation rate, if you have no idea about the irrigation rate. The transportation distance from Colombia, Indonesia, Ethiopia. The deforestation rate in Colombia, in Brazil, in Vietnam, in Indonesia, etc. The idea is that we have default data so that the different practitioner would model the coffee in the same way. That gives the results, not important in the context of our presentation today, but we really reach basically an absolute carbon footprint. For example, a gram of CO2 um, equivalent per cup of coffee for instant coffee, for drip filter coffee, for pod coffee, etc. throughout the life cycle, coffee supply, packaging supply, manufacturing, distribution, use stage, and end of life. We have this for every 16 impact categories defined in the PEF uh, rules. Until here, Everything went well. Actually, for the coffee, the rules how to calculate the footprint of a coffee were validated. The coffee is an example of PFCRs that failed, not because you we did not agree on the rules, but because the different stakeholders did not manage to agree on how to communicate that to the consumer. Do you want to communicate the impact per cup of coffee? Do you want to communicate the impact per gram of coffee? Do you want to communicate the impact per daily consumption of coffee? 
the different stakeholders did not manage to come to a, get an agreement on that and unfortunately the coffee pfcr is an example of pfcr that has to stop after the rules were validated for calculating but before the rules for communicating were validated but until this slide until this step that was a perfect example of a development of pfcr some pfcr managed to finish that's the good news so i will show you now the list of the different pilots so basically the process started with 27 pilots officially four of them left the process in the meantime like the coffee because when the stakeholders realized they could not agree on how to communicate that to the consumer at the supermarket they officially decided to move out of the process and we have, have a little bit the same issue with the meat where the debate was how to was already about the allocation but the idea of comparing meat comparing meat to a vegetarian product was too competitive the meat industry decided to leave the process for the fish, the problem is that they were lacking uh, data. So they are more on hold. They left officially, but they announced a desire to come back. In stationary, uh, they also decided to leave. The 23 other pilots are still in the game, where I highlighted in bold, underlined those that have been finalized, voted, and validated, and published. The batteries, the paint, IT equipment, leather beer dairy products feed pet food pasta wine pack water as well as the retail sector and the copper sector from an organization perspective those pilots have published their pfcr as well as a default data to be used that can be found find on the european commission website if you google pfcr um, european commission you will directly get on the page where you can upload the list of finalized um, categories. So one that are not highlighted in bold and underlined are the ones that are still in the process of being finalized. Most of them have submitted and been validated, uh, have submitted the PFCR to the commission. They, the PFCR were validated last year in November in a meeting, but at my knowledge, they are still in the process of basically doing the editing and they will soon be uploaded on the European Commission uh, website. I will now leave um, Chris Koeffler to uh, go deeper in the PEF and web process uh, based on his experience. Debbie, I'll let you take back the screen. All right, thank you very much, Sebastian. Um, I will report on the experiences of my colleagues in Europe. Um, I'm located in the Boston area, so I did not uh, participate myself, um, but I hope that I will nevertheless make a little bit of sense today. So, come on, next slide. Um, this is an attempt at a flowchart of what has happened so far. And first, um, just want to talk about uh, the pilot phase a little bit, which is what this represents with the draft PFCRs. The different industries um, started their pilot projects and their ThinkStep was involved in a few of those. So. Um, we led the modeling side of things um, in the footwear pilot, the sheet metal pilot, the rechargeable batteries, and also in the copper organizational environmental footprint uh, sector. And part of the reason why some of these uh, rules are not finalized yet is because the remodeling phase of these um, are currently still being finalized. So um, apparently 
uh, things that is currently also my colleagues in Europe are currently remodeling also other pilots that we were not originally involved in, but now the remodeling task was kind of uh, handed over to to them. So they are trying to finalize those as soon as possible. And after the remodeling is finished, um, you can then have the final approval of the category or the sector rules. And uh, the outcome of this remodeling is those representative products, the benchmarks um, that Sebastian mentioned, which will go into uh, an official uh, PEF uh, database to be used as, as benchmarks. And this remodeling effort is um, a pretty complex uh, task, actually. Um, you have to use the official environmental footprint packages provided by the European Commission. So in terms of uh, documentation, it's based on the ILCD format. Uh, they have their own flow list, which is not the same flow list that we're usually working with in either um, uh, Gabi or um, uh, uh, Econvent. It's pretty close uh, to Gabi, but not exactly identical. And then they also have their own uh, characterization factors. Uh, in the complexity then goes up considerably because um, we needed to exchange data across different software platforms with different pa partners using different databases and so forth. And all of that went into the remodeling step where uh, we updated the foreground data, uh, we updated the PEF background data, and we updated it with regard to any changes in the category rules. So that is currently still going on, um, but hopefully finalized soon. Now, speaking of data, um, if you look at the uh, JRC website, you can find the PEF and OEF uh, data nodes. So these were originally uh, tenders that the European Commission put out for different uh, sets of data. You see um, the energy and transport, packaging, agro-food, metals, and so forth. And um, it was 14 tenders in total, and uh, I think step uh, one eight of those, and the others data uh, suppliers include Qantas, Econment, uh, industry associations, and did I miss anybody? I think the other ones are all industry associations. So this is um, not just publicly available, but it's free of charge. So this is data that is available to everybody, anybody, who needs to um, create their own PEF. And it's not just available, but it's even mandatory. So in order to create consistent PEFs, it's necessary that you not only follow the same rules as laid out in the, in the category or sector rules, but it's also critical that you use the same background data because you don't want to generate you know a competitive disadvantage simply by using a different electricity data set or something to that effect so you can check these out those are already up and uh, up and available um, there may still be updates coming out but uh, the website is already there And with that, with the finalization of the remodeling and the provision of all the necessary data and the benchmarks, uh, the transition phase can then begin. And that's actually the point uh, where we are right now. If you go to the uh, PEF, uh, the homepage, they have a website here on the transition phase 
And if you read that, you will find that there is a current deadline for applications to the transition phase, which is the 7th of June. So in order to get involved in this transition phase, you need to send an email to uh, uh, DG Environment and let them know that you are interested. In addition um, to volunteering uh, to participate in the transition phase from like an industry perspective for, for the product category that, that you are um, uh, in, uh, they are also uh, installing a new and open technical advisory board. And 50% of the places uh, will be reserved for the members of the pilot phase technical advisory board. But the rest is will be distributed on a first come first serve basis. So that's another uh, avenue for participation um, that uh, you may want to explore. In addition, for the transition phase, there will be uh, what's called an uh, EF help desk. Um, and uh, ThinkStep uh, was awarded the contract for uh, hosting the help desk together with SGS and uh, Maki Consulting. Uh, so that is exactly what it sounds like. It's, uh, it's uh, basically a hotline to call, but uh, in addition, um, uh, we will organize webinars and uh, trainings on the, on the PEF. We'll uh, create a catalog of frequently asked questions. Uh, there will be methodolo methodological advice uh, available where necessary, and we're going to support industry in the transition phase. So since this is a, a North American or US uh, webinar, what what does that mean? What you know? What what is it you should do? And quite obviously, um, you should get involved in the transition phase uh, if uh, if you may be affected in the future by any policies requiring um, uh, PEF or OEFs. So with the transition phase, you still have uh, the opportunity to influence PEF, uh, the category rule contents. And after that is finished, um, likely around 2022 20, uh, to 24, um, they, uh, they will scope the policy around the PEFs because that does not really exist yet so it hasn't been decided you know what how mandatory these things will be in the future you know will it just be for like public procurement or will it be generally for any product sold in the eu in these categories so that all needs to be fleshed out um, in the in the policy test phase so that's still an opportunity for US companies that sell products to Europe uh, to engage with the European Commission. So I will do questions at the end. That was my uh, my part. So Sebastian is just going to show a couple more slides um, to finish us up. And then we can uh, take some questions, I think. Thank you, Chris. Indeed, I'm just going to finish with a conclusion, or let's say the take-home messages. Uh, in summary, if we look at the glass half full, we can say that this process led to a guide and a guidance. So the guide are the general rules and the guidance are the detailed default assumptions to be made. That is available. And here I'm putting my cap of uh, LCA practitioner to say that at least I feel it's a strong, strong step ahead in standardizing the LCA with the different modeling rules, the background data set, impact assessment, etc. And that definitely makes the life 
of LCA practitioner easier. At least we remove uh, inconsistencies among practitioner that are simply based on, oh, I took an average or I took an assumption. At least the assumption is the same for everybody. Um, throughout the process, as I mentioned, there is more than 1,000 people that has been involved directly or indirectly in drafting those PFCR, including about 200 people who are meeting regularly. I would say it has caused a strong dissemination of life cycle assessment in Europe. And not only in Europe, but also in the suppliers. I was giving you the example of the Colombian coffee producer. They are suppliers of European consumers. And seeing the glass half full, I would say we have a strong consensus on several of the meteorological points. And with that, I would say it's increasingly difficult to justify not to follow the PEF rules. What I mean is that if you're doing a life cycle assessment for your products, if you're in Europe or if you communicate with a European uh, client, if you sell that you have not followed the PEF rules, there is a high chance that the person asks you why. Why did you know, did not follow the PEF rule? Um, as we mentioned, it's not yet mandatory to use it, but the European Commission is strongly pushing to make it mandatory for green public procurement at least. It other countries, he says, if you want to have life cycle assessment based rules for green public procurement, please use the PEF rules. In theory, it aims to be mandatory for all the products sold in Europe. And the word sold is in the capital letter because that is important for you as North American. Because if you want to sell something in Europe, in theory, you have to follow PEF. And then if you are part of a multinational that has activity in Europe that is following PEF. There's also a high chance that the same company doesn't want to have a different rules in different continents and is requiring to follow PEF for every life cycle assessment. So that's maybe a European centered approach, but I would not be surprised that the PEF would be quickly becoming the international, the international standard for footprinting. But I'm very happy to discuss this point with you during the question and answer uh, moment. I thank you very much for your attention.